So let's, let's get back to the, the sessions now uh, following the coffee break. Uh, and I'd like to introduce Ben Turner, CEO of Origin, to kick us off. Thanks a lot, Connor. I think I, uh, <laughs> I bolted a little early there. Um, good morning, everyone. It's, it's a real honor to be presenting at this prestigious event. Um, and I'd also like to say a huge thank you uh, thank you, sorry, to everyone who's made it possible in, in quite difficult circumstances. Now, I'd like to begin today with everyone using their imagination. I, I want you all to imagine a world where future generations benefit from a stable climate and healthy oceans. Now, <laughs> no mean feat, uh, and ultimately to do this, we will need to restore the atmosphere. In order to avoid catastrophic climate change, we are going to need to cut emissions rapidly. That should be a pretty uncontentious statement. But here's something slightly more contentious. That is not going to be enough. We will burn through our remaining carbon budget for one and a half degrees in a few short years and the two degree budget in a few decades. We need to not only cut emissions extremely rapidly, we also need to remove carbon from the atmosphere. Now, the numbers are huge, almost to the point of being incomprehensible. We need to reduce our 40 billion tons of emissions to zero and remove over a trillion tons of carbon dioxide already in the air. My name's Ben Turner, and I'm the CEO of Origin. We're a UK-based startup developing technologies to remove carbon from the air in a way that is safe, permanent, and massively scalable. So you're probably all thinking, wow, this is, this is a big problem. How, how are you going to do that? Well, our technology leverages the power of the Lime Cycle to capture dilute carbon dioxide from the air and concentrate it in a way such that it can be safely and permanently stored. In the first step, we react lime with carbon dioxide to form limestone. And in the second step, regeneration, we break this lime down into lime, which is reused in step one, and pure carbon dioxide for storage. Each time we go around this cycle, dilute carbon dioxide from the air is concentrated and stored, resulting in negative emissions or carbon removal. From a commercial perspective, we have a phased approach that allows to generate near-term revenue. At the moment in time, we're currently pre-revenue, but I expect to generate our first revenues in 2023. In the first phase, our regeneration technology can significantly reduce the emissions from producers of lime, steel and sugar. These are huge global industries, but we are focusing on the UK initially before targeting Europe and North America. In the second phase, the scale market, our removal technology can enable low cost, large scale carbon removal. We anticipate a multitude of players within this space, the oil and gas industry, infrastructure developers, industry and government, all being partners with businesses like ourselves. The US is the most advanced in this space, 
given their existing storage infrastructure. However, we're starting to see quick action from the likes of the UK, Norway, and indeed Australia, to name but a few. This approach allows us to de-risk the commercial opportunity whilst lay laying the groundwork for the much larger carbon removal opportunity, which will develop as countries push to achieve net zero. In developing all of these technologies to remove CO2 from the air, we create a huge amount of intellectual property in the form of patents and know-how. We then work with industrial partners to co-develop and deploy the technology at scale. Our revenue is derived from four sources, consultancy services, licensing and royalty fees, as well as equity income from the co-developed uh, projects. This allows us to do three key things from a business perspective. Firstly, protect our IP, that's critical. Secondly, minimize our own capital requirements. And thirdly, scale the technology much more quickly than we alone would be able to do. Now, these technologies and that co-development approach has quite attractive economics. In our phase one markets, lime, sugar and steel, as a reminder, we're able to generate revenues anywhere between about $100,000 and $300,000 per plant on a purely licensing revenue model basis. If we convert these uh, projects, and ultimately depending on the financial structure, these revenues could be up to $1.5 million per plant. And in the large market of carbon removal, were we to put a price $100 a tonne on carbon dioxide, which is no means unlikely, Origin can generate revenues of up to $3.3 million on a licensing basis. And again, if co-developed, this number increases significantly. As you can see from the IRRs, these are very profitable projects. What else is out there? Well, this space is very busy at this moment in time. There's lots of alternatives being developed across both traditional carbon capture and indeed the removal space. In the more developed carbon capture space, where carbon is typically captured from flue gases, there's very well-established and profitable players. Their names are up there, but in particular, Aka Carbon Capture and Mitsubishi Heavy are some of the leaders. And there's also an increasing number of really innovative startups, Sea Capture in the UK, Svante out in North America. However, within our core target market of carbon removal, there are much fewer competitors. There are, however, three very well-known competitors, Carbon Engineering, Climeworks, and Global Thermostat. And it's great to see the hive of activity and these businesses progressing as they are. I haven't said it yet, but there will be no single technology that solves the problem we all face. It's great to have all of these competing technology solutions. At this point, to deliver on such a grand, audacious goal, we need to talk about team and what a great team we have at Origin. To deliver on this whole opportunity really comes down to have the right people with the right skills and the ability to deliver. We have a ton of skills within Origin, but above all else, three key standouts in my eyes. Firstly, we have serious expertise and knowledge of the science and technologies required for solving climate change, as well as a deep regulatory and policy landscape understanding. Tim Kruger, our founder and CTO, brings these skills. Secondly, world-leading specialist engineering expertise, something we have in an abundance. Barry Jenkins and Christine bring those skills. And then finally, we have a clear commercial focus and project implementation expertise. Alan complements my commercial skills with a long and distinguished career in industrial project management, including significant car capture and storage experience. 
2020 has been a great year for Origin. Um, we've really gone from strength to strength. And I'm super proud of the team for all of their support. We recently closed a funding round to take our total funding, 3.7 million pounds so far. We have signed an industrial partnership very recently with the UK's leading independent line manufacturer, Simpson Birch. That partnership is critical to Origin. Um, we will build and operate a demonstration of our regeneration technology that will ultimately result in the world's first zero carbon line. That is line production with no carbon emissions associated. We expect this to be operational by the end of 2021. And the partnership, as I've said, it is critical to us. It provides us with an enabling partner who has significant operational expertise. Furthermore, it really helps us to de-risk the commercial rollout of our technology across the worldwide lime industry. In addition to that, we've been fortunate enough to formalize relationship with Tate and Lyle's Sugars, and we've recently applied for Rant to conduct an engineering study that will decarbonize their entire London site. That's about 90,000 tons of carbon dioxide. This opens up a great commercial opportunity for us in the sense that we'll be able to build our equipment on that very site, as well as six potential opportunities across the rest of their asset base. Even more interestingly, and perhaps more excitingly, in the long term, our solution has the potential to transform the sugar industry into a net remover of carbon dioxide. And then still going in 2020, um, finally our carbon removal rig at Heriot Watt University became operational in September. This is really exciting uh, and testament to our engineering teams who uh, assembled this and got it operational. Um, experiments are currently underway. Uh, all the data collected from that is being used to refine our existing technical models. And the great thing about this is it helps inform the design and the integration of our large scale, low cost carbon removal solutions. Our goal is to become the global leader in carbon dioxide removal. And <laughs> that's quite an ambitious undertaking, but one I, I strongly believe we can achieve. We have unique technology, a fantastic team, and as you can see, a highly credible plan. Through the course of the past two days, we've heard many of the panelists and, and presenting companies talk about the need for collaboration. And for Origin, collaboration means not only collaboration across industries, but also with our investors. We are looking to raise six and a half million pounds from institutional investors. These funds will allow us to accelerate the developments of our regeneration technology, as I mentioned, in terms of our partnership with Singleton Birch and moves us closer to commercialization. The funds will also further enhance our carbon removal R&D capabilities, as well as ensuring that we continue to protect our valuable intellectual property. I'd like to leave you with three key takeaways when you are thinking about origin and hopefully talking to people about origin and our ambitious goal. Firstly, origin is a highly scalable IP and development business. We possess strong scientific engineering and commercial expertise. And finally, we have unique technology proven regulatory and funding support, and most importantly, established commercial interest in our technology. Aside from the obvious environmental and societal benefits associated with solving climate change, I truly believe that solving the climate crisis is the greatest investment opportunity of our time. Thank you very much for allowing me to present and I'm happy to answer as many questions as people would like to ask. Thank you, Ben. First one uh, come through, what is the IP strategy going forward and what is it centered on? 
Absolutely, uh, really good question. So IP for us is uh, around entirety of the cycle. The core technology of um, the cycle is this regeneration unit that we're hoping to build by the end of next year. Um, a lot of our technology and IP really comes from know-how. So as distinct from patents, know-how is all about how you assemble uh, technology to do what you want it to do. And so from an IP perspective, we uh, have two existing patents. We have five patents applied for around different parts of that cycle. And then will be a huge amount of intellectual property generated as we assemble, construct, and ultimately operate the different plants that we are hoping to build. Does that answer your question, Connor? Yes, I think it did. And then what are the site plans for the, the plants, so the CO2 removal plant that you mentioned? Could you just uh, elaborate on uh, what you're getting at with that question? I'm not sure I quite understand it, sorry. So from the presentation uh, a few slides ago, uh, in the, the plans for the next uh, couple of years, uh, you had uh, the plants that you'd be building and constructing, uh, just the site locations and who you'd be working with on those. Yes. Okay. Good question. Thank you for clarifying. Um, so Singleton Birch is really our, our key partnership at this moment in time. Um, as I mentioned, they're the UK's leading lime manufacturer. They produce about 20%, uh, uh, 15 to 20% of the UK's lime. Their site is just south of Hull uh, in the Humber region. And the Humber region is the largest industrial emitter of carbon dioxide in the UK, about 12.5 million tons is emitted in that particular region. Partnering with Tilton Birch there, we have access to that whole ecosystem. Storage and transport uh, infrastructure is being developed. And that for us is our key kind of developmental market. Singleton Birch are an immediate customer um, once we have got the demonstration technology operational. And then the other sites um, with Tate and Mile, at this moment in time, we're very much focused on their London site, but Tilton Lyle is actually owned by an American sugar refining company called ASR Group. They have sites in Baltimore, Toronto, uh, California, and so those are potential sites as we roll out this technology. And then you, you mentioned throughout uh, lime and sugar, what are the main focuses going forward and where else is, is this going to be applicable? Absolutely. So I think um, understanding that two-phased approach is really critical to understanding origin. Um, as I mentioned before, it really helps to de-risk the commercial side of the business. We can generate near-term revenue from addressing the lime industry, the sugar industry, the steel industry is also a user of lime. Um, and I've got a few conversations lined up with some of the big UK-based steel manufacturers to explore um, some synergistic relationships there. Going forwards, though, and ultimately our, our real goal and target market is CO2 removal at gigaton scale. These partnerships are ultimately going to be with a combination of public sector institutions, i.e. governments, um, as well as companies like the existing oil and gas industry, infrastructure developers, etc. The way I see this world developing is this is a waste management problem. Carbon dioxide has use. We can recycle it, but it's also a waste management issue. And we are going to have to partner across the entire value chain to really ensure that we solve the problem in the way that it needs to be solved. So what is the, you know, the, the market size and then your addressable market within that? Absolutely. So um, the lime industry currently is about a $50 billion revenue opportunity to origin. That's the whole lime market. There's about 2,000 kilns globally. Um, an origin kiln costs anywhere between 15 and $25 million. So that gives you an idea of the size of that market. Um, and then when we fast forward to the size of the carbon removal market. Well, it's very difficult to put a number on it. Um, various articles, probably the best one to um, reflect 
is a, a recent economist article which talks about carbon removal being a multiple trillion dollar a year business by 2030. It ultimately depends on the price on carbon dioxide. As I've mentioned at the very beginning, there's over a trillion tons of carbon dioxide that we need to remove. Put a price on that, it gives you an idea as to what revenue opportunity could be. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. So next up, I would like to welcome George Prasinos to the stage uh, with us in Monaco uh, for Exeter Oxto Energy. Thanks, Honor. Um, good morning, everyone. And from everyone watching around the world, a big hello. My name is George Prasinos, and I'm the founder and CEO of Oxto Energy. Oxto Energy is an energy storage technology provider. Our purpose is to transform the way energy is stored to meet the world's demand for sustainable energy. And we can do this in various ways, but our focus market and our key customers are EV charging providers and renewable developers. Now, one of the challenges that we're addressing is around the electric vehicle uh, market and especially their charging capabilities. By 2030, the world will have 250 million electric vehicles that will all require fast charging. Now, the challenge there is that the grid is not ready for this. Most likely, we see that installation and locations of installation are not capable to have fast charging installed. So, what's going to be done? Either the developers install these fast chargers close to where the capability is, or they pay expensive upgrade and uh, fees in order to upgrade the infrastructure and enable these fast chargers to be able to be installed. Now, this creates a lot of limitation on the ex expansion of the fast charging network, but also on the adoption of electric vehicles. And it, it also though, creates a problem to the electric grids worldwide as well, because we've never had such big loads connecting at very unpredictable times to the network. So there's also a grid balancing issue there. Now, our technology can address both these issues. We can enable and, uh, well, electric vehicle <laughs> chargers uh, developers and installers to install the charger where they want to, but also balancing the grid while doing so. So our technology is environmentally friendly, energy efficient, low cost flywheel. It was developed initially for satellite applications on board the spacecraft, for IoT controlled and energy storage during orbit. And I have taken this technology and have brought it down to Earth to commercialize it. We have a number of patents, both UK, but also international. And we have had from the Solar Impulse Foundation our technology validated technically. Inertia drive, which is uh, how the guys in the labs call it, uh, we're working on a less technical name. Um, it's a next generation flywheel. So flywheels, they work, uh, there's a very basic principle. There is a motor generator that absorbs energy and spins a rotating mass. And the physics behind it is that the heavier the mass is and the faster it spins, the more energy you store. Now we call our system next generation because we have combined the motor and the flywheel into one element, as you see from the animation. So this enables us to have fantastic performance characteristics substantial cost savings, environmental aspects, but I'll go into all this in more detail in a sec. So once you charge the system, so you have the spinning mass, you reverse the process to take energy out, so you're decelerating the rotor and converting the kinetic energy that is stored in the rotor back to electricity. And we can do this uh, for 25 years for an unlimited amount of times. And the amazing thing is that the same performance that we have day one when the system comes out of the box, we have 25 years later, no degradation, either or energy or power capabilities. In addition, this technology, our technology actually, it is a very high power and can deliver and absorb high power very quickly. Also, uh, it, we have by design made it easy to be able to be manufactured and to be able to be installed above ground, which gives us a lot of flexibility and availability about installation sites and also decreases the cost of installation. And all that will combine it with the low operational cost. And now all these attributes, all these technical characteristics 
and what our customers want, the combination of those. And this is what we offer. Now, since the beginning of the year, we have secured over two million uh, pounds in signed contracts in a variety of applications. For example, we're supporting in Rwanda, electric vehicle charging infrastructure uh, for uh, government vehicles. In France, I'm working with a consortium uh, to support the energy management of a large solar farm. In Kenya, with our partner over there, over there called Aria Energy, we're helping their customers in order to be able to balance their supply of electricity because they have a bit of unstable grid for tea factories. So as the tea, the tea has a very particular process to be made, we're supporting them to have a very stable supply. In the UK, we're working with Southwestern Railway in order to enhance the energy recovery and increase the energy recovery from their trains, which otherwise was going to be wasted, and capture that energy and use that energy to charge electric vehicles and electric scooters at their stations. And finally, uh, in Nice, uh, working with the University of Côte d'Azur, we're offering our technology you know, to support their ambitious targets and projects for smart cities. Now, the technology was developed by myself back in 2011, and that was for a satellite application. Uh, in 2015, when I saw that there was an opportunity for this technology, if it will work on Earth uh, for the energy storage sector, um, and after some market research, this first small prototype was developed. And it was fully tested in 2016, validated that this technology does indeed work efficiently on the ground. This is the time that OXTO was born. 2016 to 2018, uh, with my team at the time, we were working on developing the large full-scale prototype with experts at some universities, namely the University of Nottingham. And once this technology was built, we had validated by an Austrian utility that confirmed that all, everything works perfectly and it was something usable for them. From then on, we worked with our organizations in the UK around the manufacturing capabilities, so to make the system easy and capable to, to make it in large volumes. Uh, first quarter of 2019, uh, the first unit came out of our uh, like model uh, supply chain. Um, and at the moment, we're going through the certification, functional testing, and to get the C market in order to allow us to sell the units to our customers. We're aiming toward the low, low volume manufacturing in the beginning of next year, and by the third quarter of 2021, to be able to deliver large-scale manufacturing. Now, our financial projections are based purely on our current pipeline and the inquiries that we have received. We're estimating a healthy uh, revenues for the next five years, and we're estimating to be able to have a 23% EBITDA by 2024 with 13% retained earnings. This in addition of us increasing our manufacturing capacity and capability, actually doubling it uh, every year. And we're going to achieve that through our diverse business model. Initially, we'll be offering direct sales, so outright sales to the customer, along with installation and the maintenance contract. Or offering a power as a service, which is going to be based on usage-based service agreement. Um, so we'll be charging them on kilowatt hours or megawatt hours they use every month for their applications. In some instances is that the customer cannot buy the units, either for a regulatory or for other reasons, uh, will be also willing to go into a joint venture with them under a revenue sharing agreement. We have confirmed revenues of 1.8 million for 2020 and 2021, and we're looking at a minimum equity investment of 2.5 million, which is going to support us to finalize, actually support us on cash flow, to finalize the, the test and certification. Uh, to help us deliver the first pilot projects and also make us ready to be able to uh, increase our manufacturing capabilities. And even at this low level of 2.5 million, we can still see that we have a quite good revenue and a profit margin potential for the next coming years. Now, as a shareholder and CEO of this business, I'm really proud of our environmental impact, which is so low. To give you an idea, to deliver and produce one megawatt of energy storage using our technology, which is approximately 16 flywheels, will require 70% less CO2 than the equivalent installation using lithium ion. Now, another really interesting benefit is that because our technology is built entirely out of steel, without any rare earth metals, any chemicals, or any hazardous material, it can be fully recycled at the end of its lifetime, which is 25 years or even more. And it does have a residual value in it. So at the end of the lifetime, there is some value in this asset, which is quite rare for the industry. 
And especially if we compare it with more traditional lithium installations, uh, even after the first, second, even sometimes third life, um, there is the issue of recyclability. Like, you have to do something with the chemicals. And this is an additional cost at the end of, of the life. Um, and in addition, through indirect channels, and if we uh, like focus on, let's say, a little bit on the electric vehicle market, because we're enhancing electric vehicle adoption and the capability, enhance the capabilities of people using more electrified transport, we're in direct further reducing the CO2 uh, emissions. And we see that because 60% of the people uh, that have been asked, they have this issue with range anxiety, like, the capab <coughs> excuse me, like from where they will be able to charge their vehicle. I'm also very proud of our team. Uh, my background, I'm a satellite engineer for 10 years, prior working with OXTO. I've been working for this sector for the last five years, and I've been developing technologies from concept to mission to launch, uh, and this is like uh, by far, I think, the most exciting technology I have ever developed. Uh, and I also joined with uh, Michael Willemot, uh, our CFO. Uh, Michael has an MBA under his belt and eight years experience in the sector, and he's in charge of all the financial modeling and structure uh, and where we rely. Uh, Bob Carter, our sales director, uh, with a vast experience in sales, global sales, but also experience in manufacturing. And Tia Cook, our chairman, uh, who has also very large commercial experience uh, and help us with all the corporate governance. Uh, we have a team of experts, uh, our man, uh, marketing, uh, Jos Capellos, uh, join us from the oil and gas industry, uh, Katia Paran Operation, and the amazing team of engineers. Uh, we've got a specialization expertise on electrical, electronic, mechanical, and software. So as a summary, we're able to accelerate the electrification of transport. And we're going to do that by supporting the electric vehicle infrastructure, the grid infrastructure, to do that, to enable fast charging stations to be deployed. Our technology has been externally and from multiple sources been validated, and we have a very low environmental impact which is like, um, I think, one of the highlights of our business. Now, we have a very strong commercial traction from a, set of a big variety of industries. And this is more inbound traction. Like, if we just take some of the orders that people are asking us to deliver, our manufacturing capability is fully filled for the next three years. And through a diversified business model, we can offer our services to a very wide range of clientele. And we have an experienced and diverse team to support and take us to the next level. So thank you very much. Any questions? Happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, thank you George. Yes, we have a first question. Thank you for your very passionate presentation. Uh, I was going to ask, uh, what do your current revenues currently comprise of? And the other question is, how are you going to prior prioritize the different applications in terms of what, what are you going to do next in entering the market? So our revenues, uh, we have a million of awarded grants and 800,000 uh, from customer sales. Um, and our priorities... Uh, customer sales, sorry, means fly flywheels to what sort of applications? Um, it's the five applications that I mentioned. So for electric vehicle chargers, support electric vehicles. Uh, for, for the T factory, so to support the factory uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, for the train energy capture, uh, for a solar farm, and for the project in Nice, which is to support uh, like smart city projects, which has like a vehicle to grid, uh, electric vehicle charging, solar, wind, so the combination of these technologies. It's like paid pilots. Paid, paid pilot projects, yes. Yeah. And in terms of, of the market, um, because we've been asked this a lot, we're developing a technology and we are selling this technology to operators. For example, we're not doing energy storage ourselves. We're offering the technology for an operator that wants to offer energy storage services to be able to deliver these services. We're offering our technology to battery developers, for example, chemical battery developers, to make, enhance the capabilities of the chemical batteries by offering more flexibility of users, more cycling capability. Um, so we are not focusing on one particular industry. We are offering our technology to industries that require our services. Mm -hmm. 
Because in your revenue model, of course, it's uh, in the beginning you have a slower scale up, but um, some of these industries have very, very long development timelines. So how, is that in counted for in your business model? It is, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also the sales cycles, it varies quite substantially from industry to industry. Um, but we're not, the, if you like, we're not, the sales cycle doesn't initiate with us. Um, so, for instance, the project um, in Kenya, uh, the, the utility there has been engaging with the customer for some time. Uh, they've been looking at the market, they were looking for technologies that can actually be able to deliver uh, this project. And this is the time they approached us. So the pre-work of the sales cycle is already been done. Uh, so when it comes to the technology and they're looking at the market where they can get this technology, this is where we can contact them, this is where we come in, we're working with them on the technical feasibility, and we're offering our solution to match the requirements and for them to offer it to their customer. Okay, thank you. Well, you, I, you will have something to do with it, for instance, automotive to actually change into a flare wheel if you compare it to lithium-ion battery. This is, a, this is major. This is a long development cycle for the automotive, but this is an example. It, it, yeah. it, 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 it's a new market. It's an exciting new world coming up. So, yeah, we'd like to be part of it. Okay, thank you. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Um, question going to go around a little bit more on the competition, but I think it's more tailored on how you're different and on the technology, so how the technology differentiates uh, from other examples that we've seen over the years. Mm -hmm. There is a general, general comparison around whatever is out on the market. Uh, it, sometimes it gets very application specific because there are situations that normal technologies that are out there cannot deliver such project. Um, so for instance, they were working for a project that we're gonna install these units within buildings uh, in order to capture energy from lifts uh, and use that energy to power back the lifts up so to have energy savings uh, on that. Uh, we'll be working a lot uh, in New York, especially in Manhattan because of the high risers and the number of lifts they have per building. The chemical, like for example, lithium ion or any other chemistries cannot be installed in these buildings because of the fire hazard they have. Our solution can be installed. So it's not like on that particular application there is a competition, but if taking a more generic, holistic view, our system is more competitive on price compared to any other uh, mechanical storage. So we have a low price point, we have a low maintenance cycle, very long lifetime, and very high performance. Um, there are applications though, uh, for example, that they need low cycling, Okay, batteries can maybe address those, uh, but we have like on specific sectors, uh, no competition, and some others we win uh, because of our capabilities. And then, can you please give an idea of the footprint and the size? Uh, yes, it was like the photo on the last slide. Um, the unit is about a meter high by half a meter wide. Uh, they're quite heavy, they're 1.6 ton each and each unit is, has a capability of 80 kilowatt peak, and we are selling them in containers of 40 foot container. I can have 16 units or 20 units, but the standard is 16 units, um, and it can deliver one megawatt of power. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you So moving on, I would like to introduce Lex Hofslut from Lightyear, here to present. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for having me. Um, sorry, I couldn't be there physically. Um, it's great to, to have the opportunity to do this uh, virtually. Um, so my name is Lex Hofslut. I'm CEO and co-founder of Lightyear. Uh, we are a company based in the Netherlands. Uh, we were founded about four years ago. And our mission is to provide clean mobility for everyone. Um, what we do is we develop solar cars. So cars that, um, that get most of their charge directly from the sun. So we started out doing races. Um, this is already eight years ago for me. Uh, in 2012, we started a team back in university that participated in the World Solar Challenge. So that is basically the world championship for solar cars. Um, so you participate in this challenge together with 40 other um, university teams, including teams from uh, universities like MIT, Stanford, and Berkeley. And um, 
we participated for the first time in 2012 when we set up the team and we have managed to win uh, the first time we participated and managed to win all the editions after that. And, um, and that is with a new concept and that is with a four seater solar car. So not just with a one seater that you might be used to, uh, but actually the four seater uh, solar car. Um, so from that development, we realized that uh, this is a great example of how sustainability actually aligns with convenience. Uh, because having a car that can charge directly from the sun is much more convenient. You, uh, you can even get to a point where you don't need to charge at all, but it's also much more sustainable. So from that core idea, we started uh, a company with the with the aim of getting to uh, one light year worth of solar kilometer in 2005. Um, the managed team, management team we have built around this um, also consists of industry veterans. So you've got Hans Heimans here on the slide, he came from Volvo. We also recently hired someone from, uh, from McLaren to the project management department. Um, you see me on the slide, Ario is CTO. Um, basically, if you look for anyone on the planet that was most about building incredibly efficient solar cars, then it is Ario. And great to have an experienced CFO from uh, Fatboy as well. Um, and uh, the logos in the bottom indicate where the people come from uh, that work within Lightyear. Uh, so one third of the team is uh, coming from a high tech background, which is incredibly important if you want to develop a product from scratch, from a blank piece of paper which is important if you want to build, build extremely efficient cars, um, but also people from automotive because you don't want to make any stupid mistakes and you want to make sure you also get a car that's reliable, that's watertight, that's uh, etc. cetera, like crash safety. Uh, and the last category are award winning teams. And those are the people that from either the World Solar Challenge at uh, sort of um, competitions, but also Formula Student where they build electric cars. Um, last but not least, are, it's on the team, the advisory board. <clears throat> Very proud to have people from all different industries which have been in really key position. So, uh, Faxius, my DC, so DSM, um, but also Flores, who was responsible to, to choose the autonomous driving partner at Volkswagen. Um, Jella, who was responsible for all supercharging for Tesla worldwide. Um, Phil, uh, who has been a Silicon Valley entrepreneur and sold his company for half a billion. And Louis Vermeer, who designed our vehicle and is, is one of the top 10 designers in the world. I was very happy to have this advisory board. And basically, they are uh, just one step away from anyone wanting to talk to within the industry um, and broader than that. So this is the team in our office, 120 people. So it's already uh, quite a large company. Uh, 70 to 80% of the company is R&D, developing technology to uh, get to that goal of building incredibly efficient electric vehicles. Um, so that gets me to the point of what makes Lightyear different. Um, and to put it into one sentence, it's a radical focus on improving efficiency uh, from systems level to every component. Um, and to explain to you why that is important, I want to take a few steps back and, and uh, look at what we all want to achieve within the automotive industry, and that is to give also the early majority of people, so the 34%, an electric car. Uh, the trouble, however, with this group of people is that um, they expect EVs to be as capable as ICs, so as combustion cars. So they expect electric cars to be as capable as combustion cars. And uh, that means uh, doing all the business driving without any delays, it means uh, just be okay to use the AC and the heating all the time, um, that you can drive fast for long periods of time, uh, and the list goes on for a bit. Uh, and last but not least, uh, people don't want to pay premium over their RC car. So uh, this is a hard problem to solve, and if you put it in numbers, actually it's all about energy. Um, so if you go back to what uh, the amount of energy that the mass market battery pack can hold. And also, so batteries are improving, but everybody agrees that it's not at an exponential pace. So people expect that for mass market cars, you can afford to buy a 60 to 90 kilowatt hour battery pack. Uh, and that's in the coming five to 10 years. Um, so if you look at those use cases that I just listed, uh, they all require more energy than what is 
actually available in that 60 to 90 kilowatt hour battery pack. Um, so this is an inherent problem. And actually, so the really the only way to make this work, to actually give uh, a lot of range for a decent price is efficiency. So that means just um, making sure that the electric car uses less energy per kilometer. And that can actually reduce the, so what we do with our technology and our platform is reduce the energy consumption by half. Uh, and therefore making all of these use cases possible with a relatively small battery bag, which is key for cost, of course, to get to, uh, to cost efficient electric cars. Um, and if you, and this was all without solar, right? So I didn't, uh, so we didn't account for the, the solar panel that is on the roof of the car. So now if we add the solar panel to the mix, um, then the magic thing about the solar panel is that it can recharge, if the car is efficient, it can recharge your commute every day. Um, so it means that you wouldn't have to charge for weeks on end um, uh, for if you just did your commute. If you do long trips, you can use fast charges or other, or other means of charging. Um, and we do that by virtually integrating a few key components that are needed to actually enable a different architecture. So we have motors directly in the wheels that frees up a lot of space in the middle of the car. We use that, that space to improve the aerodynamics of the vehicle. Um, the battery pack is, is thinner uh, and it's the highest specific energy pack, energy, uh, energy density pack of the industry. Um, we have a lightweight ch uh, chassis and body, but we do not compromise at all on safety. Safety is key. Um, and we develop our own solar panels in-house. To get into a little, little bit more detail, so the inward motors, uh, we develop, our, they compromise and they make out the most efficient drivetrain in the world for electric cars. Um, and this is a huge enabler for us. The second one is that because of this different architecture, we can improve the underbody aerodynamics and because, because we improve the underbody aerodynamics, um, but also the, the tail of the car, um, the larger one will be the most aerodynamic five-seater production car in the world when it goes into production in 2021. Um, we built the most efficient automotive grade solar panels in the world. Um, and this is one of the uh, less formal tests, I should say. So it just came from, from a more formal test where it was on a, uh, a, a, a vibrating uh, a test equipment um, and this indicates the strength um, of the, the solar panel um, and then there is a great a short video on uh, on YouTube as well on our like your channel uh, which you can see to get a bit more feel of our prototype uh, I cannot show it to you here to you know well I can but then you won't have sound so uh, I'll uh, skip to the next one um, to get a little bit more into the solar panel bit. So why would you want a solar panel on the top of your vehicle? Um, it is a great benefit for all those people that cannot put their car on a driveway. So uh, they don't have um, the, the, the possibility to use a home charger. It's people that park on the street or people that live in apartments. Um, because if you put your car out of uh, out in the sun at your workplace, um, and of course, in, in winter and summer, there is some differences, uh, but in general, uh, you'd get to about 10 chargers per year for just your commute. Uh, so that means that you would only need to find a charger once every month uh, for, for your commute instead of requiring one to find, uh, yeah, to find one every three days, which is a huge difference in convenience. So that means that also people that will live in apartments or need to park on the streets can drive electric cars. Um, and to make it more visual, this is an example for an American driver. Um, on the left side, you see the best electric car on the market and the blue lines are the amount of times that you need to charge. On the right side, you see the larger one and you see that in the summer, you need a lot less charging. It is, this is not only for uh, commute, by the way, but this is also including all the other trips you do. And, um, and if you take a step back and look at, hey, how how uh, do you differentiate from other brands in the market like VW and Tesla? Um, we can provide more range at the same price. Uh, so that means that we, um, we can deliver cars that are pleasing for customers, 
without requiring incentives uh, to be given out. And secondly, uh, you need you don't need charging infrastructure, uh, basically, um, or, or very little of it. Uh, so that means that the charging, charger density can be a lot lower and still be able to give people comfort that can drive an electric car. Uh, so that means you can be on all the, the, the three extra boxes that are shown here on the graph. And that is how it differentiates. So we, we focus on the toughest markets for EVs. Um, and if you look at the revenue potential, what you see here, the, 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 the serviceable addressable market is the, is the black line. So those are all the vehicles that are sold within our category or segment. Uh, the blue line is the production by Bloomberg of how many EVs are sold within this category. Um, and we say, hey, we are, so in every aspect, our larger vehicles will be better than combustion cars. So that means you can actually sell electric cars to customers that are still hesitant to buy an EV because of either range or charging or cost. Um, and uh, this is, of course, a huge revenue potential. And you can go to be larger than some of the automotive brands that we know today. Um, if you look at execution, what we do, we focus on an unparalleled EV platform. So that's middle. Uh, so just building the best EVs in the market. Um, we collaborate with two major partners. One is production partners. So that actually do the production for us. Uh, we have four contract manufacturers um, that we are in contact with to produce our volume. They're all interested to do so. And on the left side, you have the autonomous driving partner, which is incredibly important to, uh, to uh, implement create autonomous driving into larger vehicles. Uh, and they, these two partners, they, they kind of make up the golden triangle. Um, and these three partners together can really uh, uh, build unparalleled EVs um, that, are, that do not exist today. If you look at our future, we start from a, a very exclusive vehicle, a 50K price point, and then go, go towards um, a large volume vehicle in 2024, uh, 300,000 units per year, and then go on to the larger platform, which is another way of saying that, hey, yes, we're going to build cars under our own brand, but our technology will also be available for our other OEMs to use. Um, and that is that will conclude my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lex. Have thermal electric generators been considered to use any available onboard waste heat? Yes, so uh, that's that's a good question, actually. So the thermal part of the equation is incredibly important. So, um, so aerodynamics are influenced heavily by the size of the, the air intake on the front. And if you can reduce that, by either using more efficient cooling or a more efficient powertrain components or uh, kind of managing the, the energy balance of, hey, where it, can we use waste heat or can we use cooling that somewhere uh, is incredibly important. So that's, that's one major part of the equation that we spend a lot of time on. And um, we're not necessarily developing the components. Um, so we just use suppliers for that, but the, 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 the kind of the ingredients we get from the market, but we put them into a system that is that is different from what most other brands use, and it's 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 relatively complex compared to other EVs. The rest of the car is very simple, but the thermal system is quite complex. Thank you. One more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, getting beyond, I mean, it's very, uh, I can understand the technological interest and challenge of our building vehicles like that, but getting be behind the numbers that you have as addressable market, I still see a lot yeah. of practical, uh, practical issues. You know, somebody needs to still charge once a month. You say they, they might not have a charging. So if somebody parks on the street, they still have to find a charging point once a month. You have climatic differences, so the charging behavior will be different. On top of it, there are people that park their in the garages here in Monaco, for instance, most of the public garages are underground, so you're not going to have any solar charging. How did you correct for all these kind of factors in your addressable market? Um, so yeah, that's a good point. So our obtainable market, of course, was, was the red line. So we uh, we do not expect we can uh, we can serve the whole addressable market uh, from day one. 
Um, so we would focus specifically on, on those people that, that live in favorable conditions. Um, so uh, about 60% of people in Europe park outside. Um, so those that, so that's our core focus. That's, so that's, uh, that's a market that's more than large enough. Um, but if you would still want to consider also targeting the people that do not park outside, uh, then you're still left with a very good EV, right? So we can provide 725 kilometers of range at a very decent price. Um, so even if you uh, discount the solar bid, which is a huge MV convenience improver, but if you cannot use that for some reason, then it's still a great electric car. We just think that for, uh, for a majority of the market will be a, a great a convenience improvement. If that is that the case, then, then would you not consider sort of um, selling some of your components to an existing uh, auto manufacturer instead of trying to build your own? Because then the advantage um, of solar yeah, is a, gone. <laughs> Yeah, great question. So the what I um, so the key thing we do, the, our key advantage, and most of our IP is there as well, and 80% and of our time we put into that is the efficiency of the car. So uh, we just get to half the energy consumption compared to other brands, and that translates into a huge cost advantage. So one is you basically need half the battery size, uh, so that makes makes the purchase price of the car a lot lower. So we can get to the same level of range that other brands do for twice the price. Um, and the other aspect is the, the uh, usage cost of the car. So that means, uh, of course, you need half the energy. So that means also half the, the cost of running the car. Um, but especially interesting for those mark those those people that drive a lot, Uber drivers, etc. Uh, but also, of course, it's still an advantage for people that don't drive a lot. Mm -hmm. If that answers your question. Mm, sort of, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so uh, perhaps to back to why you then would uh, design your own car. Um, so basically, if you uh, uh, just use one of the components I listed, so like mobile motors or or the solar panel, or um, it would be uh, incremental improvement, uh, just a few percent, because uh, what where where the real advantage is is in the complete architecture. So the fact that we can improve the the aerodynamics underneath the vehicle, that we can and make the air intake smaller, et cetera. And those go all back to kind of starting with the blank sheet of paper and uh, um, designing every component in the car with, uh, with efficiency in the back of your mind. Uh, that's, the, that's a crucial bit that you cannot do if you just sell motors. Um, so we see huge potential in this, in this, this architecture. Of course, we are also in contact uh, with OEMs to, um, to embed our solar technology into their cars. Uh, so that's definitely, that's a, that's a second priority, but one that is definitely interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Lex. Thank you for joining us today. It's a shame we couldn't, uh, have, the, shame we couldn't have the car with us this year. Yes, we should focus on that next year. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next up, I would like to introduce from Invelio, we have Simon Koopman, CEO. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction and hello again, everybody from my side. My name is Simon Koopman. I'm co-founder and CEO of Invelio. Uh, and first up also, sorry that I cannot join in person, uh, but looking very much forward to joining Virch uh, in, in the meeting. Um, yeah, and I would like to present today to you Envelio, our company uh, focusing on the digital transformation of the power grids. And actually, the power grid is the most important, largest, and also most complex system of, of humankind. Um, as you can also see on this slide here, it's really at the core of our modern civilization. And now this core system really has to undergo a fundamental change if we want to achieve the climate objectives worldwide um, and if we want to have really a successful energy transition. That means that we have to integrate hundreds, millions more of renewable power plants, hundreds of millions of charging points and also billions of smart meters into the system and manage all of the processes with these new systems connected. And that is a challenge. Uh, if not to say a big problem, because the workflows and IT systems at the distribution system operators, um, so the grid operators, the ones responsible for the grid infrastructure, they are not really ready for this changing energy system. 
So in many cases, there are very isolated, inconsistent data silos of enterprise legacy systems that are in place at, at those companies. And those lead to very time consuming manual processes with a lot of system changes uh, whenever you want to work with, with data associated with the grid. And also smart grid technologies that can help to flexibilize the grid and manage it more efficiently with a high share of renewables and, and also charging points. Those cannot really be considered in those, in those kind of processes because the decisions become much more complex once we talk about a smart grid uh, and those cannot be handled with, with the processes that are typically in place today. That's, that's where we as Envelio come in uh, and we provide the intelligent grid platform to utility companies and grid operators. And the intelligent grid platform is a software as a service solution that uh, aims at automating typical planning and operation processes in grids. So the intelligent grid platform or in short IGP is ba basically a digital grid management system. And we divide it up into three major parts um, or three major application areas in, in our solution. The first piece is focusing on data quality. So here we actually build up a digital twin of the real grid based on machine learning alg algorithms and an automated expert system. So here we really connect to the legacy systems which are already in place at the utility companies. Uh, and we uh, create a very easy way of getting to really a working digital grid model across all voltage levels all the way up until the, the, the final end consumer in the grid. And this digital model can then be used for planning applications and operation applications in the platform. And on the planning side, our focus here is on delivering faster and more cost efficient good investment decisions. And on the operation side, it's all about um, enabling a real time view of the grid, a real time transparency of what is going on, actually also in the last mile uh, of the grid. So here we enhance our digital twin of the grid with sensor data in, in minute intervals so that we get a real-time picture of what is going on. And then we uh, also have optimization algorithms in place that can automatically control the grid and, for example, manage large amount of charging points in a grid, uh, also high shares of renewables. And in these three application areas, we have a modular App Store concept behind that. So there's a range of apps in each of these areas and the customers can uh, choose these apps over time. Um, and so we kind of follow a land and expand strategy with our customers. So typically starting out with data quality, which is at the core of everything. Uh, then the next step is typically planning uh, in the digital transformation because the, the smart grid should be, should be planned before it can actually be operated. Uh, and then more and more um, and, and increasing over time um, operation applications come also into play uh, once actually smart grids have been established. <clears throat> What this looks like in reality, uh, I would like to show you here uh, with our work together with Enel as, as one example, one of the leading utilities in the world. Uh, here you see an example of one of our applications called Online Connection Tech, uh, and this tool can actually directly integrate it into the website. And what you see here running in the background in a matter of seconds is the um, connection rest for a new solar plant. And today, Typically, it takes several days or actually weeks until the feedback on this kind of request is given to a customer. And well, yeah, you just witnessed how, how fast it can go with our solution. It's a, it's a matter of seconds, seconds, and it can be given right away on the website. Um, this, is, this is one example of the applications of our platform um, and, and what, what we actually mean with the, with the whole focus of automation and optimized decision making. Uh, so we can really help to alleviate one of the core bottlenecks that, that we see as upcoming in the energy transition um, because the grid processes really have to also um, be adapted to the mass market that is coming. Yeah, and then coming over to our business model. So how, how do we earn money with our platform. Uh, well, as I mentioned before, it's a software as a service solution. So the business model here uh, has actually two components in our case. Uh, so the first one is a one-time fee for onboarding, um, where we run the first series of automated data cleanup um, for, the, for the legacy systems of the, of the grid operators. Um, and, and that is already paid as a, as a one-off fee in the beginning. <clears throat> and then there is a recurring software as a service fee for each of the apps on the platform. And for each of the apps, um, the fee scales by grid size. So um, that's how we are also adaptable to different sizes of grid operators. So large ones which operate half of a country or even a full country, all the way down to small city level DSOs uh, that, um, that can also use the solution. <clears throat> and 
what what creates a, a strong position for us in the market is that um, our overall platform approach is pretty unique and pretty different from what has been done in the in the industry before. So of course there are already different software solutions in place that that tackle different of the topics um, associated with with planning and operating a grid. Uh, but the clear USP that we have is on the one hand side the whole data quality component. Um, so there are basically no competitors um, that that actually do that and can do that with this level of automation that we can um, in, in cleaning up um, the legacy data systems and get to uh, to really working grid models. And here we uh, <clears throat> have specialized repair algorithms in place that do that. And then if you look uh, within the planning and then in the operation side, uh, what, what distinguishes us here is the high level of auto automation uh, in, in, in the full workflow integration that we provide to the platform, like, like just shown in, in the example. Um, but also the optimization algorithms that are behind the platform and that come from our founding team, from the PhDs that we did uh, before we started the company. Um, and finally, on the operation side, a core um, um, distinguishing feature here is that we are scalable across all voltage levels. So it's not just something for, let's say, the transmission grid, um, kind of the highways of the of the energy grid. We can actually scale down since we're able to handle large amounts of data all the way um, until the last mile of the, of the grid, which connects the end consumer. Um, and as you see, well, in each of these areas, we have already a distinguishing feature, but then we actually connect it all together in one platform so that we can also exchange data between the different applications. And we actually build on the same data model in all of the applications. And that is another major synergy and major advantage our solution can provide. Yeah, and that's also, um, at the core of the reason why um, why we see uh, since starting the company already quite a lot of traction uh, with our with our business model um, we are a germany-based smart grid uh, startup company uh, but now we are expanding on a, on a global scale <clears throat> so the company was founded in april of 2017 uh, as a spin-off from aachen university in germany um, actually one of the major european energy research clusters as for co-founders, we were previously researchers, uh, so we did our PhDs in power systems engineering and computer science. And in those PhDs, we developed the underlying algorithms that are now coming into use in the platform in the area of planning and operation. So where we have really focused on how can we actually integrate smart grids and make smart grids happen. Um, and since starting the company, we have now scaled up to 73 employees. Uh, most of them in, in Germany, but also um, some in Sweden, in the US and in Australia as, as part of our international expansion. And we have to date raised 7 million euros from two German venture capital funds and AGF and Demeter Ventures, a, a French VC. Um, and uh, well, our last round was a Series A that was at the end of last year. And since starting the company, we have also been recognized with, a, with quite a quite a bit of awards but of course the major driver behind our growth are is our customer base <clears throat> and here we are now at more than 20 customers uh, grid operators as our customers in in europe germany and south america and actually uh, with our especially with our german customers where we first started out we are now in the failure it's not just pilots anymore but we are, where we are really talking about full rollouts across the entire grid and with those rollout customers have long running first the service contracts um, and actually we are covering uh, roughly 17% of the German distribution grid already. And so from the data integration side, from the quality side, we have quite a big, big chunk of the market already. Uh, but of course, we only landed with those customers and we have significant expansion potential over time um, since we see that, that there's a need also for, for other applications out of the platform which are not yet being used by those customers. And to also put the 7% into, into, into perspective, um, so this kind of translates to grids integ integrated into our platform um, that are looking at more than 8 million grid connection points. Um, and all of these grid connection points are actually modeled in our platform with time areas and everything related to that. So it's a really a large amount of, of data that needs to be processed in, in one of those installations. Yeah, next to our German strong customer base and our mention, of course, um, where, where we are most mature in the customer relationship, um, we have also started our international expansion. And you see uh, among uh, the pilot customers here in particular, you see some of the major heavy, heavy weights, the international UT industry. So Enel as the largest grid operator in the world uh, with subsidiaries in, in different countries, not just in Italy. Um, 
uh, E.ON Group in, in also in other countries than Germany, Iberdrola or Vattenfall as the major player in Nordics. Um, they are among um, our, our customers already. <clears throat> and that also translates into the, the core KPIs uh, of, of the company. Um, so we, we see that we have really found product market fit and that has been validated since we started the company in 2017. Um, so we have ramped up revenues to roughly 2 million euros last year. Um, we have also increased continuously the new customers that we won in each year. Um, and also, uh, if, you, if you look at the amount of data integrated, which is kind of an indicator on, on future growth potential, because we see an upselling opportunity with, with customers once they, are, once they are onboarded, we are now at more than 100,000 grids. Um, and so there's, there's already quite a lot, large potential in the platform so for, for future upselling. It's, and also where I come to, to the steps and what is currently happening uh, with, with us at Envelio and, and what is, uh, we are focusing on, uh, where we are focusing on, an, on a growth strategy with two major objectives. So the first part of the strategy is the international expansion and the second part is the expansion of our platform with additional applications. Um, and on the international expansion side, it just makes sense that uh, because the energy transition is, is very much a global topic, um, and actually grid operators everywhere in the world face very similar technical problems and, and technical challenges, um, at least for the industrialized energy systems, that is true. And we have validated that with the free electrons program where we were a, a part of the cohort last year. Uh, that's an international accelerator program where uh, we met 10 international utilities from North America all the way to Asia Pacific. And with that initial validation and also the first projects that came out of that, uh, we have here now uh, set up our international sales regions. <clears throat> so we have one for the German speaking part of Europe as kind of our core region, uh, also coming, um, coming from, from the point since we started the company. Uh, then we have added uh, a VP sales for the rest of Europe, for North, North America and Asia Pacific in the course of this year. And also on the product expansion side, we have long-term SaaS contracts in place with our rollout customers focusing on planning and, and data quality. But we do see a significant upselling potential with operation apps so that we can actually really, from a technical perspective, cover the full life cycle of a smart grid. And here we were also able to, uh, uh, to, to successfully achieve the first upsells uh, this year. So also this part of the strategy has been uh, has been validated. And so, um, yeah, we are fully focusing on, on the continued execution. And yeah, that's why, why we are also looking for especially new utility customers at the moment that wants to drive forward digital transformation, but we are also open to partnerships in, in tackling our new markets in Europe, the US and Asia Pacific. Um, and of course, and that's that's my main main item for, for today, uh, we are also looking to expand our investor network uh, for a Series B that we are um, loosely planning for the middle of 2021, uh, not quite yet figured out exactly, um, but um, I, I would also, always like to start early with discussions on that. Um, so I would be happy to have this, 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 that discussion later on. Um, you can reach out. And now I'm very much looking forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Is your technology compatible with a network of off-grid distributed energy systems? <clears throat> yes, that's actually also also an option. So, um, for us, it's it's well, we are coming from a technical perspective with our solution. Um, so, so basically, it doesn't really matter how big the grid is. So we can it can be a small small microgrid, let's say. It can be a small distribution grid in, in a street in a, in, or even in a city or scale up to a, to a regional level. You alluded, you alluded a little bit uh, to the Series B. So what are the uses and plans then for, for, and for, for that expansion um, and going up to the, to the larger arrays? Yes. Um, so so far, as I, as I said, we um, strong validation for um, the current course of our strategy. Um, but then to to really further accelerate that strategy, um, we we see that additional funds would be really helpful um, in doing that. So, um, well, our our 
international sales regions are in the initial setup phase now, and, and there are first, first people in, in each of these regions. Um, but then actually, let's say, fully exploiting a huge market like North, North America or a, 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 a huge region like North America, also, also the APEC region in total, um, that would require uh, more resources from my perspective. Their additional funds can just help to accelerate things um, very much. So that would be the main, main use of the proceeds. <clears throat> you didn't mention um, Africa at any point. Is, is that in the plans? Well, we, we see that um, for, for now, our solution as it is, is, is best fitted for, let's say, industrialized energy systems. Um, so kind of the, the markets which are uh, the development of utility companies have a, have a similar um, maturity, let's say, like in, like in Europe. Um, and, and so that's also how we, we focused our actual phase now of the international expansion. We do see that, uh, that also for, uh, let's say, more developing um, energy systems, we can become a relevant solution. Um, but this, this is rather something that is, that is a bit more down the line, um, where we would, I think, need some additional adaptions also on the product side and, and further developments on the product to be also good for, for these kind of markets. Okay. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you for joining us. Yes. Happy to.